Sorry, written on the board here. We are actually now on class 14, and last week it was actually class 13. The time to tell you that is not after <laughs> the fact. <clears throat> but we just now found out. So, in the interest of better confusion, we seek to establish what the real deal is now. Okay, we are in Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> We've been looking at the situation with Lot, and uh, Lot has departed and gone to the best, you know. Um, <clears throat> he's chosen the best for him. And... Uh, I was thinking about that today, and I can't remember exactly how it was going, but I was thinking about the Lord, and um, <clears throat> the Pharisees were trying to choose the best route for them, their, their uh, positions, their um, respect from others. They were trying to choose the best, and Jesus to chose the worst which was the cross. And um, there is that um, uh, carnal mentality, and the reason why we, we call it carnal, because that's a, that's a scriptural word that's used. Uh, it wouldn't be considered carnal mentality in the world. In fact, in the world system, it is to be promoted, it is to be higher, it is to be better taken care of. It is in every way <clears throat> something with an orientation that is up. And in the Lord, um, he, and in, in that situation, uh, if you laid the template of the lower seat over that situation I just described, Jesus took the lower seat. He took the lowest seat. And he did it for the ones who took the higher. He died for, for them. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we're going to read, uh, we're in Genesis 14, verse 8 through 12. And there went out uh, the kings of Sodom and the kings of Gomorrah and the kings of Adma and the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. When Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, and with title, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five, and the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. <coughs> uh, and they that remained fled to the mountain. Okay, well, there's a good example of that. We already know from Lot that the best place in the land was Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because that's where he went. He said it was like the like that garden of God. Um, but you know, <clears throat> you know, when you put yourself first, you're going to end up in the slime pits. You know, you're going to fall there, and you're going to be stuck. Um, <clears throat> and and of course, I, again, I'm not. I'm not referring to the world. Um, I'm referring to what is the way of the Lord to place others first, to place the Lord first in your own heart. <clears throat> Verse 11, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals, which this is King James, so all their food, and went their way, and they took Lot. Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So the significant thing about this war and the history of this war is that it mentions Lot. <clears throat> and by mentioning Lot, therefore, Abram ends up being pulled into this. Um, but I, I say pulled into this. Uh, I believe that he was honorable. I believe what he said to Lot when he said, choose 
whatever you want was a genuine thing of his heart. He wasn't trying to be spiritual or humble. Huh? Huh? Does that, does that speak to us? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> it wasn't trying to be Christ-like or trying to be this or that. It was, it was to, to honor um, someone above yourself. And so Abram said, take whatever land you want, and, and Lot chose the best land. And, and now in verse uh, 8 through 12 that we just read, you have... Um, it wasn't such a good place after all because there are other kings, other kings than the one that are there when you choose it. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and there are slime pits that we might not have been aware of. Um, so, uh, but, but Abraham or Abram is being honorable in that he's treating Lot like his brother, okay? And remember, he called him his brother, and I think there's another place in here <clears throat> that he does that. Uh, and for Abram to call Lot his brother is a significant step toward what God wanted out of his, Abram's heart in the first place because in his heart, he'd been calling him the firstborn. Yeah, so brother's good, brother's good, you know, and, uh, and, and he, that, he sees that in us too, <clears throat> he sees that in us, if we're treating ourselves like we're the firstborn, we may not call ourselves the firstborn, but if we're treating ourselves like the firstborn, like all, it all belongs to us, and, you know, we have, well, I have a say, and all this kind of stuff, and, um, well, in the, in the law of the firstborn, he got the double portion, but he was also over the family, and he was, there's much more, and we see that as we proceed through the scriptures that, uh, in Genesis, um, that there is um, <clears throat> all of that that we claim as our own. We claim that that's ours. And we act like we're the firstborn. And we act like we're the heir when we are joint heirs, but he's the heir. Right. You know. And the only reason why we're even included as an heir is because we're joined heirs. We're joined to the heir. <coughs> and so we, uh, we, we may call it just being a Christian. You know, I'm just being a Christian. I want everything that God has for me. I want the best, you know, from the Lord and all this stuff. <clears throat> okay. But in one sense, the best thing that all the other brothers, right, because the firstborn and then the rest are brothers, right? And he called Lot brother. Um, <clears throat> the best thing that they actually inherit is Jesus as the firstborn. When he becomes firstborn, that's the best thing that could have happened to him. Okay? Um, it's real hard not to want to jump into Jacob because there's so much good stuff there. But, <clears throat> okay, so... Um, uh, calls him brother, you know, <clears throat> some people, when some Christians, when they don't see the firstborn in somebody, because the firstborn inhabits us, when they don't see the firstborn in somebody, they don't want anything to do with them. They treat them like they're not even in the family. But they're still brothers. If, if a person is born again, they're in the family of God. And, and from everything I can see, they're saved. Okay? Or if you want to use another word, certainly delivered by the death of the Lamb. Okay? So, um, you know, we can get this attitude, uh, and I'm, I'm equating this 
you know, contrasting this with Abraham, Abram looking at Lot and still calling him brother, we can look at people, <clears throat> whether it's within the, the church here or anywhere else, or go to some Christian gathering and go, well, these people don't you know, know the Lord the way we do or whatever. The, the goal isn't for the goal isn't to, for everybody to know the Lord the way we do. We, you know, there are groups that know the Lord way beyond anything that we know here. <laughs> there are individuals that are so far beyond us, it's incredible. And so, you know, we shouldn't be thinking that that's something. But to look down on someone else... <clears throat> I mean, even Lot, I mean, you, you would say, okay, Abr Abram has every right to look down on Lot, but he doesn't. He literally gets up and he's going to go protect him. And he's going to save him from himself. He, Abram knows that, right? He's going to go save him from himself because Lot chose that area and that's the area that rebelled. Right? That's where the rebellion came from. That's what the scriptures we read, you know, from 8 through 12. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, it could be, well, you're an idiot because you cho chose this. Or, you know, you're, you're, you know, just instead of calling them brother, you just think of them as carnal, carnal. <clears throat> well, they may well be, but we all were, were and maybe still are. And we need to, you know, what, beloved, let us love one another. <laughs> Amen. One, one family. And I know that Jesus doesn't look at you or me and go, oh, you're so, you're so deep. You're so special. You really are. You're almost like the firstborn me, but you're not quite there, but you're so close. I don't think that's going on in his heart, you know. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we can, we can say it as we're knowing the Lord, well, I, you know, I love all these people, but do we respect? You have to respect them in the fact that they are brothers. They are in the family, okay? And we don't, you know, it, that go, to, to do anything other than that is, is wrong orientation. It means that we're being the ones lifted up and they're the ones low. Let's get lower than them and lift them up. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, Let's look at verse 13 now. <clears throat> and there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. I like it. Abram the Hebrew. First time it uses that word uh, in the Bible. <clears throat> For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre and the Amorite, brother of Eskol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abraham or Abram. So. Abram was the first Hebrew uh, based on this verse. Apparently, you know, Lot must have told someone in Sodom that he was a Hebrew because when this guy escaped, he came to Abraham and mentioned what had happened to Lot. Um, and then I wrote uh, Mamre, the person, because Mamre and Eskel are people but it's also the name of that area that they're at that Abraham has bought, Abram has bought, and is going to be changed or is changed to Hebron fellowship. Okay. So the, the father uh, that he bought this from, uh, ultimately, anyway, the, the, his sons here were, were named Mamre and Eskol. And I'll leave it to you to search out those names, but <clears throat> one of the things that comes to my mind is that um, when Israel came 
to the edge of the land, and they'd, they'd gone through the wilderness. They came out of Egypt, traveled through the wilderness, got to the edge of the land, and Moses said, go in and search the land <coughs> and, and bring back some of its fruit. And so they, he sent in 12 spies, each, each representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. <coughs> and they go in, and they uh, search the land. And when they come back, they have a, between two people, they have a big old thing full of grapes called the grapes of Eskel. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that way down the road before Israel even exists, Abraham brought that, got, bought that land and possessed that land. And that land began to be blessed and, and fruitful and more than fruitful, extremely fruitful. And they brought back the fruit of that. <clears throat> but the problem with that is, and this is, is a truly problematic thing, and that is that they began to complain about the land and the giants and everything, and they wouldn't enter in. And we can develop a, an attitude in a way where we kind of go in to the land, into the word of God, and we go in there and we get things from it, good fruit and good realities and big plump um, things from the Lord that we feed on, but we never enter in. We just make quick trips in to get what we need and we come back out and we live outside of the land. And we can do that regularly on a regular basis. That's who we are. We are, we are the rebellious that will not enter into the land. And, but will it will, you know, because to enter in is to become uh, an inhabitant, to inhabit the land. To venture in, to venture in just to get something good to take to the people outside of the land that are still in the wilderness, that are still wilderness wanderers, is not what God wants from us. It's not his heart. It's not his desire. He promised them the land well in advance of that. You know, they, they can say, well, through Moses, he said there's a good land and we should, we should leave Egypt and go there. Well, he promised it to Abraham and his seed. Okay? So... Um, to not enter into the reality of it where this is where I dwell and to make sort of a, a, a glorified fruit stand outside of the land and feed people good stuff is, is you know, I was going to say an abomination, but it's certainly sad to the Lord because it's not, it is nothing like what he had in mind. You know, and here's the other part of that is, is that they didn't do it because there were giants in the land. There were giants. So they're going, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to live in there. And so they're living outside free from trials, conflict, battles. We, we are, we are the wise ones of Israel. We have chosen a place where there is way less conflict, you know. And, and it feels God is shining on us here in the wilderness, you know, on the edge of the land. Because we had the best of both worlds. We have the best of the land and we have the best of the wilderness. <clears throat> well, anybody remember what God said when they wouldn't enter into the land? He said, if you're not going to enter the land, he said, you will wander in the wilderness for 40 years and you will drop in the wilderness and bleach your bones here. Okay, so what is that? Well, that just, that just proves God's mean, right? No. It proves that God is serious about what he's trying to do in our lives and if we're just acting... Christian 
instead of Christ in you, the hope of glory, if we're just going through the motions of, <clears throat> of the things that, that we feel are important, you know, and that can be, I mean, that can be anything from um, uh, world evangelization to family first to, I'm trying to remember all the ministry names of all the stuff that, that have, have been raised up as the most important thing. And the scripture says that we are meant to be inhabited of God and that we, we are a habitation of God through the spirit and that we are, in him we live and move and have our being, okay? In a him. It's in a him, not in us, in a scripture, that, uh, two, two words, in, in him we live. I live, how do I live there? I live in the knowledge that somehow, some glorious way, we're in Christ and da da da. No, to literally live in him, to live as if an organ or some part of him, to, to live as joined, to live as his life flowing through us, to live as if it is Christ in us, the hope of glory, to, to um, live gloriously even in death if Christ so chooses to give himself through us. Paul said, whether by life or by death, that Christ would be magnified in my mortal body, in my body. Okay, magnified. It didn't matter to him. Life or death, doesn't matter. Jesus gives his life. Jesus will live through us. You see that? So, um, <clears throat> so there is the <clears throat> there is this thing. There is this um, religious dwelling that can be formulated where we are outside of the real things of God because it is God. We're outside of that, and we're we're striving to be a good Christian, you know, and I've said this many times and it shocks people, Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was not a Christian. He was the son of God, <laughs> you know. He was the son of God. He just is. He didn't go, oh, well, let's see, you know. While he quoted the book a whole lot, he's quoting himself. <laughs> you know, it's the word of God. He's God. He's quoting himself. You know, he's not going, I got to adhere to this. I got to be kind to, you know, to my enemy because it's written right here. I'm a Christian. Jesus never, he never approached it that way. And his life in us and us in his life still doesn't. <clears throat> there is freedom. But the freedom is in him, you know. Uh, so, that's enough. I need to move on here. But that's, you know, sometimes the Spirit of God's trying to uh, bring some things home to us. Um, let's look at verse 14, starting with verse 14. <clears throat> and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, see, there it is, his brother. He's moving to help his brother. Okay. He armed his trained servants, both in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, and he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. All right. Um, well, 
I was thinking about <clears throat> in, in the Exodus, and the very first words, as we know, when God spoke to Moses when he was yet in the wilderness, way before he got to Egypt and stood before Pharaoh, he said, um, go say to Pharaoh, let my firstborn son go. I mean, I, we're all familiar with let my people go. And that was included. He did say that later, but the first thing he said was, let, I, I want them to let my firstborn son go. What's he wanting out of you, you, you Egyptians? <laughs> he wants you to quit holding back his firstborn son. Amen? He wants you to let him go. And stop holding back and putting yourself first or putting, you know, you know, Jesus standing there ready to be with the Father and we step in front of Jesus and, and go, oh, would you help me with my problems? Cutting off the relationship of the Father and the Son, the Father with his firstborn son. So that was the first thing. But when they got in there and then the deliverance started happening, it happened when God said, here is the final thing I'm going to do. He said, you take a lamb and you slay that lamb, slay that firstborn lamb, and then you put its blood on the doorpost. And anyone who does not have blood on its doorpost, the firstborn is going to die. Their firstborn is going to die. That's you as the firstborn, thinking that you're, you're the firstborn but no slain lamb in you. So that's, you know, God's going, this is the way it's going to go. <laughs> you know, you're not, you've been pawning yourself off as the firstborn. But those who eat the lamb, slay the lamb and put the blood and then eat the lamb, their firstborn will live. Okay. So when God brought Israel out, he brought two groups out. He brought the firstborn that was saved by the death of the lamb because that blood saved them, not everybody, not all of Israel. It saved the firstborn. Nobody else was going to die except the firstborn. Unless that blood was there, unless that dead slain lamb was done, nobody else was going to die. All of Israel that weren't a firstborn, they could have just danced around and go, we don't care because we're not a firstborn. But the firstborn said, get the blood on the post now. <laughs> okay. So that meant that the dead lamb and the blood didn't just deliver the firstborn. It, it was their redemption. Whereas everyone else, they were delivered. Okay? But guess what? To the firstborn, Israel was still their brothers. See, I know I keep bouncing on that, but it's, it's important. You know, it's good to see there was two dividing things there and to see how much God wants his firstborn son out of us. But if God is forming that firstborn son in us and he is starting to, to live and be let go, if that's happening, we still can't look down on Israel for just being delivered because they're still brothers. Are you, are you okay with that? <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> all right <clears throat> I did mention here these brothers always look to, to deliverance as their solution and not unto a sacrificial death and it's true this is one of the things that you will see well you, see, you know what we're seeing it with Lot we're seeing it with Lot Abraham everywhere he went Abram Everywhere he went, there was an altar, and there was a death. We have no record of Lot building an altar, okay? But when he gets in trouble, he didn't build an altar. 
he goes to one who does and says, Get, you know, deliver me. And Abram could have said, you know, you should have noticed all the altars when you were with me. <laughs> you know, that's the connection that I have with the father through his son, the slain lamb. That's what's going on here. But you never saw that. You never really got it, you know. And so because of that, you believe in the same God I do, but you just don't know him as slain lamb on the throne. So therefore, you only see him as deliverer. He's meant to deliver you. His purpose in life is to deliver all the lots of the universe, or at least on the planet. <laughs> so that's, you know, and, and Israel again, when they came out, the firstborn came out because of the death of the lamb and the blood, and the, the blood is because of the death, and then and the rest of them were just delivered. And that will follow all the way through, all the way through, all the way through for each story that we pass through in the book of Genesis to the very end. It'll always be the same. And it'll always be the one that is the firstborn. But they're not the firstborn. It's the firstborn being formed in them. Jesus is the firstborn. And that's the important thing to realize. <clears throat> All right. So verse uh, 14 again. <clears throat> um, let's see. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan, <clears throat> and divided himself against them, and, and he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them uh, unto Hobab, which is on the left hand of Damascus. All right, so... Abraham doesn't have trained warriors. He doesn't have power mongers. He doesn't have Conan the Barbarians. He's got servants. He's got... If you, if you went to some sort of a wrestling match and in one corner was Conan the Barbarian and the other one was some little skinny servant who was real good at his job, which do you think would win? Okay, well, let me explain that maybe your definition of winning is wrong. <laughs> maybe your orientation is wrong in relationship to that because we're going to see the story right here. Um, I wrote, God will win with those who are servants first. Because <laughs> he did. He won with those who were servants first. I mean, I, don't, I, I didn't read all the way back here, but you, you sort of remember, I'm sure. I mean, just the number of kings that were involved in this thing, not counting, you know, uh, uh, titled king of nations, Remember him? We read his name off. Dude, okay. I'm thinking that they've got a lot of people, you know, and Abram's got how much? 318 servants. Don't just, you know, it's not like 318 top warriors. Yeah, yeah like they were. Yeah. They got 18 more Skinny guys with trays. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the other people have trained warriors and have many battles, and I, I'm referring back to verses one through seven now. They had already gone through a bunch of nations, a bunch of uh, uh, battles against other kingdoms and kings and united kings, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, and others were joined with them. And they had just lost. They had lost. 
That's why Abram's getting involved in this thing. Because Lot's gone because Sodom fell to these mighty kings, this confederation of kings. And if you read back through verses 1 through 7, you realize that this is a massive amount of people that are just sweeping through and knocking everything down as it goes. Uh, so I didn't finish the sentence. The other people have trained warriors and have many battles, yet they will lose a battle against 318 servants. All right. All right. Now, before we get too far, I want to say to you, don't think that they won this battle because God performed a miracle. He, they won the battle because they got low, because they came in weakness, because they were not displaying pride and boisterousness of who they were and anything. They were lowly enough to trust only in the Lord. And, yet, and you know that they must have, 318 are going out at Abram's word and going, you know, let's fight all these guys. Come on. They did. They went out. So it means that Abram put stuff in them about being less instead of greater. So don't, don't think in terms of power miracles, you know. Verse 15, uh, let's see, did I read that? Um, but when it pleased, oh no, I've got that down here. Verse 15, and he divided himself against them and he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobab, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So I put, he pursued them all the way to Damascus, the Damascus area in the north. Okay, because remember, this was in the south. Remember, Lot chose that direction. They have chased... <laughs> <laughs> 318 guns. <laughs> I'll hit you with my pad. <laughs> you know, all the way to Damascus, which is in the north. Most of you probably know kind of where it's located, but it's on the way opposite other end. And um, uh, let's see. The, Abram does... Uh, Okay, so he pursued them all the way to Damascus, the Damascus area in the north. The, Damascus is where Paul was defeated twice. 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 Big defeat there for all of his strength. Big defeat for all of Saul of Tarsus' wisdom and strength. And, and, and as he said in Galatians, I, I was out distancing my brethren, you know, by far. Like this was a competitive race to know the Lord and everything. And, and it was all this, this personal gain thing working in him. The first time he was defeated was the road to Damascus, right? Maybe the same road this other battle took place and the great had fallen. And there he meets Jesus. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Me, me, me. Are you Saul? Are you Paul? Are you Saul? Are you the firstborn that you can persecute me? Are you of something of such stature that you can stand against me and resist me and think that you've already attained and think that you're already better? 
something. You don't need me. You don't need to get lower. You don't need to get at the foot of the cross to find me because that's too low for you. And the second time, <clears throat> but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. Didn't go to the great city of the founding of the religion, as it were, and those who were apostles. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus and after three years, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. He was struck down on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> and he saw this as it pleasing God to separate him from his mother's womb, from his old life, from the way that he was into an eternal relationship and called me by his grace. But see, here's we read that sentence and it says, and he called me by his grace. We say he called me by his grace too. But we're talking about saving me from hell. <clears throat> he didn't finish his sentence here and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Paul didn't see it about just getting saved from hell. He said, here's the grace of God that God revealed his firstborn son in me. The comma, <laughs> that I might preach him. That I might preach him. I don't preach salvation. You understand what I'm saying. I Paul's heart and soul and innards were, were captivated, not just his mental capacity to understand religion. He had that before, but his inwards are captivated, and he's preaching the one he saw. The one he met. He didn't meet him in church and he didn't meet, you understand. It, in other words, it was when he was at his worst to go kill Jesus' people. Well, what a great place to be. You are the least, Paul. And remember, he never forgot that either. He still called himself the less than the least of all saints and the least of all the apostles. It was the best thing that happened to him. And Jesus, look at it from Jesus' side too. I'm here for you. The one who doesn't deserve it at all. And you're going to write most of the New Testament for me. <laughs> you know them 12 apostles that you didn't go up and spend three years with? You're going to be the one that I use to spread, to even open your eyes to more than just salvation. <clears throat> so I wrote down, in defeat, Paul wins. Those two trips to Damascus, he wins. And Abram chases him all the way to Damascus, and he wins with his weakness, his servants. His lowliness is less than the least. <clears throat> and verse, verse 16, uh, let me make sure I got it here. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Abram brings back the goods that were taken from Sodom. And he also brought again his brother Lot and his goods. And, and where did they end up again? Sodom. All right. Have you ever looked at somebody and went, oh my God, I know where you're going to end up. You're so off from what's the Lord, you know? <clears throat> 
So you go, so you, so you, you save them, not from Sodom, I'm, I'm using the story here, you save them not from Sodom, but you save them from the things that are the result of them going there. Because of the war and because of the rebellion of Sodom against Chedorlaomer. So you save them from the effects, you save them from the results, but you can't save them from the thing that took them there in the first place because they're going to go right back there. See? <clears throat> All right, but you still save them. <laughs> you still, you know, Abram could have said, look, I know how this is going to end. He's just going to end. If I, if I free him from bondage to these warriors, he's just going to go back there again. Well, you know what? Abram already knew that because he knew he Lot wasn't the firstborn. He already knew where he would go. He's still going to shoot for the best, shoot for the highest, be you know, in a place that's well watered and everything is wonderful. I love utopia. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> so Abram, Abram already knew that. He knew exactly what was going to happen, but it didn't matter to him. Don't you think Jesus ministered to a lot of people that he knew they were going to go right back to what they were doing? I mean, I believe that. Um, First of all, no matter who Jesus ministered to, they were exactly the same uh, after as they were before because no one had gotten saved until after the cross. So, and what, what does the cross mean? Well, the cross means we died with him and the cross means that we have another life in resurrection and that Jesus is the resurrection in me. Jesus is my resurrection. He's the resurrection in me. My hope, if that, if that be the case, my hope for a future resurrection is the fact that he is the resurrection in me. But I don't have to hope for something in the future. I've got the resurrection. He said it. I am the resurrection. And by the way, I'm the life. I'm not just the resurrection, now you live good, or you live you, or you, you know. I'm the life. So he, he knew what he was doing. The Lord knew what he was doing. I, I believe there's probably some here that have done similar things for people, knowing full well where it ends, and yet you do it because it's Christ in you to do it not because it's Christ in them. You do it because it's the firstborn in you to do it, not because it's the firstborn in them. See? And, yeah. Abram at this point where the firstborn is forming and starting to come out of him in weakness and in giving the life for Lot. You know, he hasn't been called Abram, Abraham yet, the father of Lot. He hasn't even had that circumcision to happen in his flesh yet. I mean, that's hope for the path along the way. But these things are already forming in him and, mm -hmm. and coming. There's been that turning in, like you say, spawning his brother. But something's happening inside of him. Yeah. yeah, this chart that's on the other side here that we used in the Colossians class, we will use <clears throat> eventually with Abraham also, if it can be preserved back there. Um, yeah, because um, Abram was a man to whom promises were made by God. Abraham was the living reality of that. No longer promises written down, oh, you know, they, ha they sell them in Christian bookstores, precious promise books, you know, precious promise books, you know. Well, you know, 
just read the whole thing. Don't pick out special verses that are good to your flesh. You know, <laughs> read the whole thing. And besides, it's not about pr the promises. It's about the fulfillment, and that's a person. <clears throat> and, and therefore, a lot of Christians are still living as Abram. Not as Abraham, where there's a multitude of the firstborn coming forth. The, and the firstborn of many brethren is being fruitful. <clears throat> So let me just read this last little bit, little few sentences. As we shall see later, Lot will need deliverance again, <laughs> right? Later on in Genesis, he's going to need deliverance again. And who's going to be the one who's talking God into delivering? All right. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Abram is more noble than God himself? That Abram is more compassionate than God himself? That he's more, uh, he, that he, so much so that he had to convince God? I choose to believe that God sometimes does things or says things to call out of us what is real in us of him and not be fooled even by his words. And I can, I've got a bunch of examples. I've seen this. I've got a bunch of examples. And, and he, he's trying, you know, because there needs to be, we need to release this. And we need to rele release it to God, you know. Because I've had God tell me at times, you know, okay, well, it's done. You're over. It's over with. You, you're too messed up. I'm going, who is that? <laughs> that is not my father. My father, my father is not going to say that to me because it's his son in me. He will never give up on his son, and he'll never give up if there's the slightest little spark of desire for more of his son. He's going to fan that flame. And then everything I just said, he'll go, yay, you just passed. <laughs> you just passed the test. Because you understand me. That's what he would say. You understand me. You understand the basis upon which I think and breathe and see and, and everything. And you, you stood for Lot again, even after seeing him go back. And you're trying to cover him cover like like Noah's brothers sons did to him when he was naked and God honored that didn't he yeah so there's you know now well, let me finish reading this this is I'm really not trying to time this but it looks like it's going to be straight up here um, Abram had a right spirit in delivering his brother uh, his brother Haran's son, but Israel would always have trouble with Lot in the form of Moab. In other words, not only by covering and blessing uh, are you manifesting the spirit of the Lamb and covering other people, but you are probably, uh, how do I say this, part and parcel of protecting something that's going to grow up to be Moab that will always fight against your people. So, so okay, so let's use the tree of knowledge and good, of e good and evil. Let's figure this thing out. Work it, all of you. Work the knowledge of good and evil in your head. Well, then, well, then, yeah, hold up, God. Don't even do anything. I'll go down and kill him, you know. That's, you know, that's, that's the way the knowledge of good and evil is. Well, I have to protect myself. I have to do things that will protect myself and, and my, my seed, my people, my family. My, I have to do, I have to, you know, God, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not looking. You know. But 
so many times you even know the negative results that will come back to you and you say, I will be with you, Lord. I don't care what's going to come back negatively against me. I don't care. I mean, I will when it does, but I won't care enough to, you know, leave you. You understand? Um, I would rather be with you. I would rather know that this was a choice that I had and um, whatever Moab does is the result of me releasing your spirit, then I'm, I'm just going to be with you. But see, we, 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 we're, it's the results that move us, not the spirit and the nature. We're moved by the, I need, well, I need to get a good result here. This needs to, if I'm going to do this, this needs to bless me. You know, well, it does bless you. You've just released the firstborn for God's sake. Can't you be happy with that? Can't you go, this is worth every bit of it. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to release your son. And the Father's glorified in the son that's the glory. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lindsay said they got Ruth out of the Moabites eventually, from which seed came David. Part Moabite. Oh, you didn't think of him like that, did you? I'm telling you. And was, okay, so is David worth all of the junk that they went through with the Moabites? A man with a heart after God. And what if Abram planted that seed right then? What if that took place? But see, well, I, you know, but I didn't get any of that. I never met David. All I did was, I just met Moabites, <laughs> you know. Abraham planted that seed, but Abraham didn't get any credit for it. Right. David got all the credit. Right. So who wants to plant? Who wants to do that? If, yeah, <laughs> saying, uh, if, unless your mind is renewed, who wants to do that? Right. You know. So. Yeah. Well, and that's 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 why I said let's think this through through the knowledge of good and evil. The result is not coming back to me in a better way. It's actually going to be worse, and this guy doesn't deserve any of it, and I've been good. Well, you've just changed the orientation to your higher and their lower, and that's an abomination to God. Just be low, and he can do more from that position. You know, what is the old saying? The highest place on earth is at the feet of Jesus, the lowest place. You know, but we, you know, and we can't believe that everything comes from there, and we would think that if we don't believe that. If we, regardless of what our theology says, if we don't believe that, we're not going to do it. So then you got, you got carnal Lot and carnal Abram. You see what I mean? And their story would never be written in here. Because Lot's only written in here because of... You see that? Yeah. Following what Molly said, I just, you know, just thinking about you know, just the history of the Jews and Father has been just training them, like teaching them, just like trying to get them to see through the eyes of their seed rather than where they are. You know, with the, so the Jews in the wilderness, you know, you're not going to inherit the land, your seed, because you guys refuse to go in. So you need to start seeing from the eyes of your seed. And just like repeatedly throughout, you're in captivity. You may not see the light of freedom, but you're not. You're, your oneness is with the seed, and they're going to see it. And you got to start planting, planting those seeds because you're not going to get credit. They're, they're the ones that are going to inherit the land. That's right. and so it's just, it's just this constant, like, you know, just training them. It's like, we're just showing them. Just, you got to start looking at it through the seed. You right. Because even if you don't see the light of it, that, that's, that's still where it's going to come out, and it's going to be glorious. And by the way, for, for him to do that in relationship with Lot and to, to, you know, stand in the gap again for him before God, 
is, is the operation of the faith of Abraham. That is the faith that Galatians says we're all supposed to be functioning by. Now, we're not there yet, and you know, there's much, much more that will have to happen in him. I mean, just, you know, just like the things with the sons of, what were their name, Heth, you know, and, and this situation, good, praise God, A Abram, great, but you're still Abram. You need to become Abraham, and it's a real thing, so there is seed to look back to, you know. Okay, let me just finish this, and we'll wrap this up here. Um, um, so Abraham had a right, let's say, uh, Abraham had a right spirit in delivering his brother's Haran's son, but uh, Israel would always have trouble with Lot in the form of Moab. Why would this be so? It would exist only because Lot was not the firstborn because he wouldn't choose sacrifice. It's happening not because of Abraham's right spirit in the Lord. You cannot blame Abraham. It's Lot's fault because he re refused to choose the way of sacrifice and chose the higher, better thing that glorifies himself and made him feel better about himself. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you as you continue to uh, bring us along this journey of, of discovering your son. And, and we thank you for Genesis because you're really starting your word with pictures of real ways to react and to act and to be and to show forth your son. It's not just doctrines and teachings as of a religion, but it's a way to live. And we thank you, and we ask you to continue to open our hearts and open our eyes to see him in Jesus' name. Amen.